I know D&D players are big fans of killing off characters' families, burning their hometowns to the ground, and murdering their one true love in order to spur a dramatic quest for vengeance. But have you guys thought about how much fun it could be to do the opposite of that? To have a living family that can be a part of the game with their own personalities and goals? To have a home that isn't just for flavor, but actually changes the way your character experiences their world? To make your character's relationships with NPCs have not just emotional, but mechanical impact on your gameplay? Today, I am going to show you how. This video is sponsored by the Dungeon Masters Guild. Many of you are probably familiar, DMs Guild is a community content program partnered with Wizards of the Coast, where creators can legally use official D&D material to create and share their own brand new content for use with D&D. It is a treasure trove of genius homebrew character options, adventures and settings, rolling tables and mechanics to expand your game in a ton of really creative ways. I can just get lost there. There are thousands and thousands of PDFs and every single one is like, game-changingly useful. You can use the code GINNYGUILD to save 15% on any DMs Guild content purchase of $15 or more through next Friday, August 13th. I will put the link and the code into the description. But we are not talking about every game-changingly useful supplement today, we are talking about one game-changingly useful supplement, and that is The Adventurer's Domestic Handbook by Lydia Van Hoy, including writing from Sierra Perry, Kayla Bayans, and Sadie Lowry. This extremely comprehensive book is 150 plus pages of of resources on how to incorporate family, romance, and business and property ownership into your campaigns and characters in a way that isn't just part of the narrative, it's also part of the gameplay. There is so much cool stuff crammed into this book, which is honestly why I need a whole video to talk about it. And I'm not even going to be able to cover everything. So first, I'll just give you a quick overview of what's in the book and what I think is exciting. And then I will, in full cosplay, introduce you to a brand new character that I created using the subclasses, backgrounds, and feats in included in the book. That's a lot to cover, so let's dive right in. The main domestic topics the book covers are romance, family, business ownership, and homemaking. It does a great job talking about how to include romance at your table while respecting the boundaries of your players, which is super key if you want to include anything romantic or sexual in your game. There are 24 romanceable NPCs ready to drop into your games, and each includes related quests and encounters, and even relationship milestones to help DMs show that characters are growing closer together. For example, if you open up to Bastion the Human Knight, about your own past, he will tell you about his troubled relationship with his father. There are mechanics for marriage, pregnancy, raising children. I think my favorite romance-related tool in the book is that they've provided an entire appendix of marriage ceremonies, 20 different options for how your characters might make their relationship official. Everything from the private romantic ceremony of moonlight vows to the extravagant citywide festival of many masks. They also have some great suggestions for how to make a wedding session fun for everyone at the table, like going on a quest to forge the wedding rings, or an ex crashing the ceremony to cause trouble. Maybe your character sends money home to their family to support them, or maybe they bring their family with them, caravan style. There are a bunch of options for how to incorporate a living family as an active part of gameplay. For example, your character might be saving up money to send a sibling to a prestigious school or on the lookout for a good marriage match for them. My favorite family mechanic is that they've provided an entire apprenticeship system, so a character can bring along a family member or just a favorite NPC to teach them the tools of their trade as an adventurer. This system actually allows apprentice characters to level up over time, gaining skills to help the party, like becoming proficient with certain tool sets or learning to cast some low-level spells. Does your character want to open a business in a city where the party spends a lot of time, hire staff, earn profits, or maybe they want to run a traveling shop, conducting business wherever the party happens to go, earning some extra pocket money. If I were DMing a player who wanted to do something like this, I would have no idea where to start. How much should it cost to buy or rent a storefront? How much would you have to pay employees? How much profit could you expect to turn? This book covers all of it. Personally, I love the idea of adventurers setting up a little shop where they can sell their loot or offer their services in a more formal way. Not only is it a great way to help players feel invested in a specific town or city, it's also such an easy in for quests and plots. Maybe the shop gets robbed and they have to track down the culprit, or maybe a competing shop opens up nearby and starts taking their business. It just opens up a whole host of new stuff that can happen at the table. Probably my favorite section, because I just love when I get to play D&D like The Sims, homeowners. Ownership. Maybe your character wants to buy a house or buy land and build a house. Or maybe they're like my character, Ash, 
Ashling and her party and they've come into a house but aren't quite sure what to do with it. The Adventurer's Domestic Handbook has tables with pricing and information on everything you need to know to buy, rent, build, and even renovate or staff a home. But hands down, the part of this section that I am most amped about is the atmosphere section, which allows players to take short-term benefits from spending time doing certain things in their home. For example, the Engaged Mind Atmosphere says that if your character spends time studying or reading in their home, they get a plus two to intelligence-based skills for the next hour. Or if you rest, have a good meal, spend quality time with your family, you can add double your constitution modifier to any healing that you take over the next eight hours. And then of course there are the character options. This section includes 15 different subclasses like the Barbarian Path of the Protector or the Monk Way of the Devoted, all inspired by domestic pursuits. There are also five new backgrounds like the Devoted Parent or the Farmer, and six new feats like Pocket Healer or Arcane Guardian. I'm gonna be honest, a lot of these character options would be a perfect fit for existing characters that I have. For example, Edith would be a fantastic Harmony Domain Cleric, a subclass that is specifically noted as being well-suited for hopeless romantics. This subclass has features like Helping Hands, which allows you to magically bond two creatures, making their help action more powerful when used on one another. Or Healing Chain, which would allow Edith to provide a little hit point boost to a second creature nearby the target of any healing spell. In fact, instead of telling you about the character options, how about I show you? I created a character using the options in the Adventurer's Domestic Handbook, and I think it's high time that you meet her. How there, a fancy round of liars, Dice? It's only one silver to play. And if today's bad luck holds for me, you'll double it in a blink. No, not a gambler? That's probably for the best. It's been a slow day though, so will you at least share a story with me? Come, I'll provide the libations. Cheers. What brings you out this way? Hmm, that's a long journey. I see now why you might not want to risk your travel funds. It may be a bit strange, considering I make my living off of gamblers, but I don't like them. I much prefer the company of more prudent types, like yourself. I'm Mariska. I'm a cautious one myself, although these days I don't have to be so much. But being raised in the clutches of a sea hag, fear gets into your blood, and it stays there, like salt in salt water. Brynmore Kate, she was called. She kidnapped me as a baby. At least, I think she did. I don't remember anything before her. Perhaps my parents just gave me up. I call the other girls my sisters, even though we've no reason to think we are. But we were as good as sisters, doing her bidding. It was hard, but we had each other. I leapt at the chance to get out, though, when he offered it. Lord Winston Verdlin. I lived in an underwater city, of course, but I was running an errand to the docks of the nearby human city when I met him. He took a shine to me. To be honest, I don't know if I really liked him or if I just liked his offer. Marrying a rich man, I could get me and my sisters out. Perhaps we could have a real life, our own life. It took everything for we four to escape the hag's clutches, especially with the smallest Narina being so young. It was a near thing. The whole time I thought to myself, the only chance I've ever taken and fortune will punish me for the risk. Lord Verdlin, he didn't help. He didn't know. I couldn't tell him the truth. I wanted him to think he'd found some fine sea elf lady to be his bride. I think I was afraid that he would change his mind if he found out the truth. Foolishness, when it was him hiding a secret the whole time. It was only days before the wedding that I found out. He'd gambled it all away. The family fortune he'd sworn he would protect me and my sisters with, it was in ruin. He was deeply in debt. I don't know how long he thought he could keep up the charade. Of course we fled. Two escapes before the moon even came full again. But we had nothing. No food, no money, no shelter. Just four girls in a foreign city, desperate to survive. We couldn't go back, of course. I suppose that's why I did what I did. Even though, as I said, I'm usually quite a cautious person. I'd never played liar's dice before. They could tell, I think. The men at the table probably thought me an easy mark. We had only the clothes on our backs and a few copper pieces, just pocket change. And my engagement ring, of course, but I wasn't about to gamble that on the roll of a die. 
So I said no. But in the alley outside the tavern, I met a woman. Or at least she looked like a woman. She was fair and elegant. Her clothes were so fine, finer than anything I'd ever seen. And she offered me a pact. Lady Luck, she called herself. She told me to go back into the tavern and make a bet with my ring that she would stand behind me, turning the dice, securing my wins. 500 gold pieces, she vowed to me. Enough, more than enough, to protect me and my sisters. All I had to do was vow to serve her. Serving wasn't new to me, I had always served. What was a new mistress for me if I could free my sisters? It happened exactly as she said. They were angry, of course, the men, but she ensured we had a lucky escape. Over the years, she taught me how to control luck in my own small ways. That's the secret to this little cart. I can make someone win a little and then lose a lot. They're not really gambling, not with me. I always win in the end. So, you see, it's lucky you didn't say yes to me today. Perhaps my lady is smiling down on you as well. That was kind of you, to listen. My thanks. You will have good fortune on your journey. Fair weather, smooth roads, friendly meetings. May it keep you and yours safe for a time. Fare thee well. Mariska is a sea elf warlock, and she was inspired by the Lady Luck patron subclass and the runaway betrothed background in the Adventurer's Domestic Handbook. The Lady Luck patron gives her warlocks control over their fortune and the fortunes of others. That means Mariska gets an expanded spell list that includes spells like Bless, Clairvoyance, and Dominate Person. First level gives her proficiency in Persuasion and Deception, and Lady Luck grants her the boon of a business and an empty covered caravan to run it from, as well as a five 500 gold investment. Startup costs, if you will. As she levels, she gains abilities that allow her to re-roll her own dice and also force or help others to re-roll theirs. At 14th level, she gets a super cool feature called Turning Tides, where if a nearby creature rolls a natural one, she can use her reaction to create something called a fortune token, which allows her to force a critical success at will to balance the flow of luck. Her background as a runaway betrothed gives her additional skill proficiencies, I chose insight and perception, as well as equipment that includes fine clothes and an engagement ring. I'd like to think that when Mariska made her pact, Lady Luck transformed her engagement ring into her arcane focus, which is why I had her wearing an engagement ring in that scene, even though she is obviously no longer engaged. With this background, she gets the feature Disappearing Act, which means she knows how to make herself scarce for short periods of time without being tracked, such as if any disgruntled gamblers want to get back at her for their losses. There are also rolling tables for personality traits, ideals, bonds, and flaws. I picked the personality trait of always questioning others' ulterior motives and the ideal of preventing emotions from clouding her logical thinking. I didn't really feel like any of the bonds fit her, so instead, I'm just focusing on her bond with her sisters. One of the flaws is I hide a secret that could ruin my ex's life, which is obviously his lost fortune, although I don't think she realizes that she could weaponize that against him. Finally, I chose the feat Arcane Guardian, which allows her to give temporary hit points for one round equal to her spellcasting modifier to one ally within 30 feet whenever she casts a spell above first level. I liked this one because even though I don't see her sisters being with her on the battlefield if I were to actually play this character, I could see her developing this kind of skill in the first place in order to protect her sisters, so I feel like it makes sense for her. If I were to play her in a game using the mechanics in the Domestic Handbook, she would of course bring her sisters along in her caravan, and I think she would probably take on one of them as an apprentice. It would be super fun to try out that system, and also just narratively play out that bond between sisters who have been through the same weird, difficult childhood. I hope this gave you some good ideas about how to incorporate domestic life into your D&D game, if that would be fun for you and for your table. I know this kind of thing isn't for everyone, but as a small part of a game, I feel like these things can offer such a new and interesting facet to the life of an adventurer. And the Adventurer's Domestic Handbook is comprehensive. If you want to learn more about all of these mechanics and features and options and characters, I would highly suggest checking out the full PDF at the link in the description. And thank you to DMs Guild for sponsoring this video. There are so many amazing supplements there to explore. If you're looking for more, you might enjoy my friend Jesse's Puppeteer of Veilstone, an emotional and mysterious adventure that can be played as a one-shot or dropped into a campaign, and fun fact, was written for my birthday. Thanks, Jesse. Or my friend R. Morgan Slade's College of the Crow's Nest, a bard college for treasure hunters. I will link those in the description as well. Remember to use the code GINNYGUILD before Friday, August 13th to get 15% off your purchase
purchase of $15 or more at DMs Guild. And if you want to keep up with the latest releases and deals at the Dungeon Masters Guild, follow them on Twitter at DMs underscore Guild. What kind of domestic elements would you want to bring into your games, or have you brought into your games? I would love to hear all about your characters' families, marriages, businesses, children, and homes in the comments.